As you stand, let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, thank you to Bruce. Uh, yes, my name is Zach Neubauer. I'm a third-year seminarian at Trinity School for Ministry up the road in Ambridge, so it's about a 30-minute drive this morning, no traffic, which was nice. Um, I'm in my third year, and so I will be graduating in May, Lord willing, and have an ordination date on the 30th of January and uh, being sponsored by the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, and Greg Brewer is my bishop down there, if you know his name. And so it's, uh, it's been a very exciting ride, but my time in Ambridge is almost done, so thank you for having me. In case you've forgotten, it's now been almost a week since we went to the ballot boxes. The presidential inauguration is still 67 days away. Despite this, pundits and odds makers are already offering up theories and ideas as to who might be elected president in 2020. The Irish odds makers, PaddyPower.com, have 36 individuals whom you can put money on to be elected president in 2020. For better or for worse, your safest bet is for Donald Trump to be re-elected. Others who are included, though, are, at 8 to 1, Michelle Obama. At 18 to 1, Joe Biden. At 40 to 1, Jed. 66 to 1, New England quarterback Tom Brady. <laughs> and rounding out the list at 275 to 1 odds is Kim Kardashian, future president of the United States. The odd, no pun intended, part of this is that we are still four years away from that election. What platform, what promises would these individuals run on? What would their priorities be? Some of them, we might guess. I'd ask that you please turn in your leaflets that you're given back to today's Old Testament reading, Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25. I believe it's on page 9 of the leaflet. Isaiah was God's spokesperson 800 years before Christ. We could refer to him as God's press secretary. Isaiah interacted and communicated with the people of Jerusalem and Judah on God's behalf. And what we have in Isaiah 65 is a prepared statement by God. Isaiah announcing God's campaign motto, God's platform, his manifesto to the peoples of Jerusalem and Judah. These are the things that God is promising his people that he's going to do. Look with me at the first line of the reading. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. This verse is God's campaign motto, as it were. It's a summation of the rest of the chapter. If you don't remember anything else from today, remember that. For behold, I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, will create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind to mind. God is promising to do something so big, so huge, that the former things will not be remembered. So let's unpack that. What are the things that God is promising to do? What are these new things that are so fantastic? What are the former things that won't be remembered? What other promises is God making through his press secretary, Isaiah? Promise number one includes good things, gladness, rejoicing, joy, a close relationship between God and humankind. All these things will be made even better. We see this in the next verses. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating. For I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. And towards the end of the chapter we read, Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The people will be rejoicing in the deeds and character of God, that is for certain. But it is not just the people who will be rejoicing. 
God will also be rejoicing in and over his people. God is not some vainglory who only wants his best. No, he wants to see his people blessed as well. He is so attuned to his people that he promises to answer their needs before they even speak them. I have three sons, aged five, three, and seven months. You saw the five and three-year-old with the blonde hair heading that direction a few moments ago. Our seven-month-old Boone sleeps in a crib that's adjacent to the bed my wife and I sleep in. Boone sleeps on my side of the bed. In the middle of the night, when do I realize that he needs me? Well, on a good night, two or three seconds after he starts crying. On a bad night, after a few elbows to the ribs for my wife. This is because I'm a frail and human father. Imagine, though, if I was such a good father that I can anticipate Boone's needs before he fussed or before he even woke up. I'd pick him up, cuddle him, tell him everything was okay, and lay him back down without him ever waking up. That's the picture we have of God here. He promises to care for us so much and is so close to us that he will address our needs before we can even vocalize them. So there'll be good things that continue, but we also read God's promises that bad things will cease. There'll be no more sounds of weeping, Isaiah says. That is, no more depression, no more grief, or long-term sorrow. There'll be no more cries of distress, no ugly surprises, no sudden evils. There will no longer be any infant mortality or people cut down in the peak of their lives. In short, death will be defeated. Along with this promise of a joyous life comes the promise of a stable and fruitful labor. We read, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. At first glance, these verses might sound odd. However, by show of hands, how many of you have ever seen the classic Japanese film, Seven Samurai? How about the American classic, The Magnificent Seven? A few more, good. How about the animated classic, A Bug's Life? A few more. Hopefully that covers about all of you. What do these three films have in common? All three have a group of hopeless, helpless people who have the fruits of their labor continually stolen from them by bandits. Israel at this time was used to having this done to them. Larger, stronger groups, nations would steal the grapes they had planted and even occupy the homes that they had built with their own hands. Yet God is promising that under his reign, his Department of Agriculture, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, will ensure that these kinds of things never happen again. So God is promising that good things will continue. He's promising that bad things will cease. He's promising stability and prosperity. But in case we haven't caught on to how radical of a change this will be, we are given some pretty striking images in the second to last verse. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent... Its food shall be dust. Sworn enemies, the wolf and the lamb, will feed side by side and not on each other. The lion will no longer hunt, kill, and destroy, but will eat straw like the ox. And do you see the surprise? The radical nature of these new heavens and new earth does not mean that God just turns a blind eye to evil. The surprise in this verse is that while the feeding habits of the wolf and lion are radically different, the feeding habit of the serpent remains the same. Now keep in mind that God is speaking to his people through Israel, and in doing so, this text isn't sharp, literal prose. Instead, you're reading poetry. So don't get bogged down by whether or not serpents really eat dust. Don't worry about that part. Instead, consider the image that Isaiah is using. After using the image of the changed natures of the wolf and lion, he could have used any number of predators as a third illustration. But instead, he chooses the serpent. Where else in scripture do we read of a serpent? Think back to childhood, back to Sunday school, back to your picture Bibles. In the Garden of Eden, 
Eve and Adam are tempted to sin by the serpent. After they sin, God judges Adam and Eve, and then he proceeds to judge the serpent. We read in Genesis that God's judgment is this. Because you have done this, because you have tempted Adam and Eve to sin, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now compare that to our reading. The wolf will eat with the lamb. That is radically different. The lion will eat straw. That is radically different. But the thing that won't change is that the serpent will continue to eat dust. He will continue to be cursed. Evil will continue to be judged. We have a God who is so loving towards his people that he will not tolerate sin. The joy and gladness that he is promising will not be the result of us merely being distracted or caught up in the good things he is offering, so much so that we forget about the evil around us. No, instead evil will be dealt with once and for all. All this adds up to quite the campaign promise, summed up in his motto, For behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Now, some might argue that how could these verses, written nearly 3,000 years ago, have anything to do with us? Perhaps these verses describe some great period in Israel's past, but how can we imagine that they describe a future reality that waits in store for us? The reason is, these promises passed along from God through Isaiah are too good. These promises presume a final judgment of evil. These promises presume a final victory over death. These are finalities that did not occur aside from the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And this is a totally different kind of campaign. A few days ago, we as voters went to elect our leader. Here in Isaiah, though, we see something different. Here in Isaiah, we don't elect God. God elects us. The emphasis is not on the fact that God is our ruler, but that we are God's people. Imagine, if you would, that last Tuesday, all the political leaders of the world were freed up from their respective positions and were allowed to elect what country they wanted to rule over. Imagine you were one of these leaders, and you had the first pick. What country would you choose? Would you choose the United States? How about China? Russia? Great Britain, perhaps? Whichever country you picked, would become your people. I don't know which country you'd pick, but I can imagine what countries you wouldn't pick. Countries like Somalia, Venezuela, the Congo. You wouldn't choose humble, weak, and insignificant countries to be the ruler of. If you turn forward to the next chapter, Isaiah 66, the last chapter of the book, we'd read this verse. But this is to the one whom I will look. He is who who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. God has many people to choose from. He could choose the powerful, the wealthy, the intelligent, the bold, the famous, the gifted, and so on. Instead, God chooses the humble, the contrite in spirit, and the one who trembles at his word. Are we those type of people? Maybe today, when you came into this service, you weren't that kind of person. Through the power and love of Jesus Christ, you can leave this service today that kind of person. God is waiting to meet you today. Before you call, he will answer. While you are yet speaking, he will hear. Perhaps through Christ's death and the Holy Spirit's work in your life, you are one of God's people. You are becoming more humble and contrite and tremble at God's word. But you're tired. You're discouraged. In this life, you weep and are in distress. Death is all around you. Your labors are not rewarded. Do not lose heart. Behold, God will create new heavens and a new earth.